Hey everyone, and welcome. One of the most common complaints junglers have is that they win the early game, successfully ganking for their teammates, getting them leads and taking objectives, only for them to be utterly useless in team fights. And that's the problem we're going to be looking to address today. First, by giving you guys a tier list for the best carry junglers. And second, by going over a full game teaching you how to pilot one of these carry junglers even when you have useless teammates. By the end of this video, I promise you, you'll understand what it means to truly solo carry. Now, when it comes to carrying in League of Legends, the sad reality is the champion you choose to play does matter. For example, you could rack up a ton of kills and get a huge lead on a champion like Trundle, only for your teammates to do nothing in teamfights and your champion's kit making it so you're unable to carry yourself. This is why we thought it would be best if we gave you guys a tier list of champions that skill cap challenger experts think are the best at truly carrying and 1v9ing in solo queue. Now, when we're looking for champions that can truly carry, we want two things, someone who has scaling and mobility. The reason we want scaling is that players really struggle to end games more than you probably realize. For example, in Gold Elo, the average game length is 30 minutes. Compare this to Challenger, where the average game length is 26. That's a four minute difference. By playing scaling champions, you'll be playing a champion that can actually carry when the games get too long, which is all too common in most Elo brackets besides Challenger. We also mentioned the importance of mobility. Most players make a ton of positioning mistakes, so champions that can take advantage of this, typically assassins with high damage and mobility, will reign supreme. So let's jump into this carry jungler tier list. Now, we custom tailored this so that the champions chosen will be the best for the elo brackets between iron and diamond. This is because if you're master tier and above, well, you make up 0.1% of the ranked player base, and let's be honest, that's not exactly the demographic these guys are aimed towards. So, in the overpowered tier, we have Master Yi, Kha'Zix, Rengar, and Shaco. A champion like Master Yi offers a ton of late game scaling while having mobility and damage to take advantage of poor positioning. Bonus points if you can convince your duo queue partner to play Lulu mid or support. Your late game strength will be unmatched and it's simply a matter of time before you get that pentakill. That's not even to mention the potential funnel strategies, where you run Master Yi with Taric mid with a support item. We won't be covering this funnel strategy in detail since well, last patch they tried to nerf it, unsuccessfully, which likely means it'll be nerfed again and coming to an end soon. At least I hope. There are similar ideas with Kha'Zix, Rengar, and Shaco. These are all champions with a ton of mobility and damage, but also scale better than most people realize. Kha'Zix has his evolutions, which means at level 16 his leap will reset on kills. Rengar has his Bone Tooth Necklace, which gives him tremendous bonus AD on unique champion takedowns. And let's be honest, his ultimate pretty much gives the opponent no counterplay and Shaco's damage has fantastic scaling, whether AP or AD, but also has the flexibility of split pushing side lanes to stall out games. Moving on to the A tier, we have Jax, Kane, Kiana, and Karthus. Jax, Kane, and Karthus all offer us great late game scaling and carry potential. Specifically, Kane and Karthus will nearly always be impactful in teamfights, and as the game progresses, they will only become stronger. And before you ask, we're specifically talking about Kane in his red form. I know his blue form is a ton of fun, but really should only be used in specific situations where you're facing a very squishy team comp. And Jack's jungle is similar to Shaco in the tier above, offers us the option to split push for stalling the game further, cementing our scaling. Now, a champion like Kiana has an absurd level of mobility that will make punishing positioning mistakes by the enemy of Breeze. But the reason she's not in the overpowered tier is she doesn't have as strong of an early game compared to Kha'Zix, Rengar, and Shaco. This leaves her vulnerable in some matchups against early game aggressive junglers. I'm looking at you, Lee Sin. In the B tier, we have Shibana, Graves, Evelyn, and Diana. All of these champions can carry, but you'll notice they are essentially weaker versions of the higher tier champions on this list. For example, Shibana is all about her AP build, where she looks to farm and scale up. However, she's completely outclassed by Karthus, who does the exact same thing but better. He clears faster, has a stronger early game, and his ultimate lets him impact the entire map. This is the same idea with Evelyn. Her damage and invisibility is great at punishing enemies overextending or out of position. However, her early game is extremely weak, and she falls off a bit harder than other assassins that are higher on the list. Now, we want to be totally clear. This does not mean that if a champion isn't on this list, that they can't win games. Some of the highest win rate champions on patch 10.5 are champions that you wouldn't exactly associate with solo carrying. Set, Nunu, Trundle, Zac, after the buffs to Bami Cinder and its respective upgrades, they are topping the charts in average win rate, all being around 54%. And if playing tank junglers is your thing, then by all means, you do you, as you're totally able to climb with these champions. In this case, we're specifically talking about the true 1v9 carry champions. These are the kind of picks that challenger players use when smurfing to achieve the crazy high win rates. Essentially, you can climb with most champions, this tier list was just to highlight what is the most effective for the average player. 
All right, now with that out of the way, let's jump into the part where you actually learn how to pilot one of these carry picks. We'll be going over one of my own replays, where I'm smurfing in gold elo and I'm playing Kha'Zix against an enemy Lee Sin. Fair warning, as the title suggests, we're going to be having some issues with our teammates. By the way, we released some crazy guides on our website as part of a system based on modern learning theory. With over 700 epic guides and new ones every week, we're super confident you will improve. So confident, in fact, that if you watch six guides a month and don't climb at least five divisions if you're below diamond, you'll get a full refund. There's literally no risk. Be sure to check us out at skillcap.com, link in the description below. All right, let's jump back into the guide. As the game begins, I do a few things. First, I use the ward trick, placing a trinket ward on the enemy red buff into recalling and swapping to a sweeping lens. The ward on the enemy red will give me a definitive answer of where the enemy jungler is starting. Along with the fact that I can often show where the enemy jungler will be pathing to after he kills it, either towards his blue side jungle or his Krugs, which will inform me of his route. Swapping to a sweeping lens will mean I'll have it up for my first gank to check for wards. We've taught you the war trick before, so you should be familiar with it. I then choose to start at my red buff. You typically want to start on the opposite side that you want to gank. If we look at our lane matchups, we can see that in bot lane we have Misfortune Senna against Jin Zyra. Jin and Zyra lack escapes, so definitely have some gank potential for us there. However, when we look at top lane, we can see it's Orin against Volibear. Volibear is a melee champion that lacks a good form of escape. On top of this, Orin offers crowd control to set up the gank. Often when two melee champions face each other, they will trade a lot and get low. Essentially, there's a high chance of us getting a free kill topside after our opening route. So I start at my red, and notice the enemy jungler doesn't show on my ward, indicating that he's starting at his blue. This is further confirmed by the fact that the enemy top shows early while bot lane is missing, indicating that they're giving a leash to the enemy jungler at his blue buff. Now this is really important that I've scouted this out. Lee Sin is an aggressive early game jungler and is starting at his blue, which is the same side of the map as us. When starting on the same side as the enemy jungler, you often want to get to the other side of the map as fast as possible. This way, you can get the first gank off, get control of that side of the map in the form of lane priority, which then lets you control the scuttle crab. This is why I choose to do red, blue, into Gromp. This is the fastest way for me to hit level 3 and be on the top side of the map. Compare this to an alternative Kha'Zix route of doing Red, Krugs, and Raptors, which would put me topside far too slowly. Now, you're probably thinking I'm spending a lot of time focusing on my pathing, but I just want to highlight how my gold opponent has already made a mistake. He did Blue, Gromp, then took the Wolves into his Red. By taking Wolves, he's now delayed his ability to get to the top side of the map and gank with his level 3 spike. When we go back to my point of view, I finish Gromp, hit level 3 with double buffs, and I'm looking to gank. When I look top, I see that Volibear is strangely full health and playing very defensive. It looks like our opening assumptions were wrong, that's okay, it happens. However, when we look mid, we can see another melee versus melee matchup of Fizz against Talon, and they've been trading, which has resulted in the enemy Talon getting low. The lower the health the enemy is, the easier they are to gank and the higher the chance of success. If I go back to farming in this position, well then my Fizz will be in big trouble, as he's already losing trades and Lee Sin should be looking to impact the map and also be focusing on the low health targets mid. So I go mid, using my sweeping lens to see if I'm spotted, at the same time if Lee Sin is waiting in a brush, I'll get advanced notice. Things are clear, so I engage on Talon, and make quick work of him. Again, I just want to highlight how the enemy Lee Sin is just finishing up his red as this happens, proving just how important understanding your early pathing can be. Now, Fizz has no teleport and is out of sustain, so leaving him in this position would be absolutely terrible. Talon would head back to lane with an item and sustain advantage from having died. This is why I know I need to help Fizz push out the lane, now, I already know some of you are thinking, I could never do this in my games, my mid laner would just leave the game, accusing me of stealing CS. Here's a nice trick you can do to appease your teammates when pushing out a lane. Notice how although I'm letting him push, I'm giving him the vast majority of the CS, specifically, I clearly gave him the siege minion. It's not until we were finishing pushing, do I sneakily steal a few CS of my own. I find this greatly helps reduce the frequency of your teammates getting tilted or leaving the game. Afterwards, I spot Lee Sin executing a super predictable gank top. I say it's super predictable since he started out as blue and didn't show anywhere on the map, so he had to have passed topside looking to gank. Despite this being extremely obvious, my Orn chooses to push as close as humanly possible to the opponent's tower during this time, not place his trinket ward that's currently up, and dies to the gank. And don't worry, you best believe he let me know shortly after that better jungler wins. So when I move topside after the gank mid, I'm not just reacting to Lee Sin ganking top. Keep in mind, there's always a chance that Orn L plays and I swoop in to clean up with a counter gank. However, my backup plan has to do with the scuttles that are spawning. I want to take the top side scuttle while Lee Sin is ganking top. Then, I can transition to the bottom side of the map and take the scuttle there, and this is very powerful as I'll be double scuttling an early game jungler like Lee Sin. This will help me start to pull away in golden experience and outscaling him as Kha'Zix. 
so I take the topside scuttle and move to the bottom side of the map. However, we immediately run into a couple of problems. First, Talon just pushed out mid and disappeared. This means he could be looking to contest me at the scuttle, and we also don't know if Lee Sin is following him. Second, when we look bot, the enemy is very pushed up. This gives them lane priority and can allow them to collapse on me as well. So what I'll look to do is gank the bot lane that's pushed up, thereby securing lane priority for me and bot, which I can then use to help me defend the bot side scuttle and buy time for our fizz to get back to lane. Now, that all sounds great, but as I'm moving to gank bot, well, our Miss Fortune's keyboard clearly disconnected, and she just dies instantly without doing anything. So now this gank bot is no longer possible, as the enemy is full on health, and our AD carry is dead, so I move to pick up the lane minions instead. During this time, our amazing top laner decides now is the time to make that game winning play, and starts teleporting to a ward directly in front of the enemy. Needless to say, this accomplished absolutely nothing, except for another reminder in chat from Orn that it's all the jungler's fault. This is when we praise Riot for including the ability to mute teammates. So I head back into my jungle to farm as there are no ganks available for me. Bot is 1v2, Orn is an in lane top due to teleporting, and Talon is missing from mid since he roamed off his earlier push. I'm currently assuming that Lee Sin is on the bot side scuttle, and so I have to play defensively farming my camps. Our wonderful Orn then ganks mid, proving a point to all of us that he's the better jungler. Into then taking a less than safe path to his top tower. And you guessed it, he dies to the enemy jungler, losing a massive wave in the process. So what should he have done? Well, probably not show himself mid, so the enemy knows exactly when and where he's heading to top. Not all is lost though, as we can use Orn's superior decision making to our advantage. You see, Lee Sin has now showed on the top side of the map, and what do we want to do when the jungler shows on the opposite side of the map as us? We want to immediately look for opportunities on the same side we're currently on. In this case, I check the nearby scuttle, since it's likely still alive, as Lee Sin just showed top. Bot is missing, which could mean they're collapsing on me, so I smite the scuttle to leave as fast as I can. I then look to steal the enemy's wolves, again since Lee Sin showed on the top side of the map. During this time, I do in fact spot the enemy bot lane roaming through the river towards mid, along with Lee Sin ganking. So I quickly finish killing the wolves, and jump the wall to sneakily recall without Lee Sin being the wiser. So as I'm heading back onto the map, there are a couple things I'm keenly aware of. First, is that top lane is over. Orn is way too far behind, and is not the kind of champion that will solo carry a game anyways. So I'll be ignoring that lane. When we look bot, we can see our teammates are pushed up and vulnerable to a gank, and same with our mid. This is why I'm moving towards both of these lanes, so I can be in position to counter gank if Lee Sin tries to gank them. I'm also timing this with my nearby red buff spawning soon. Sure enough, Lee Sin shows bot side, but then backs off. Meanwhile, Talon is back in mid lane. Now, my mid laner Fizz has ultimate, ignite, and flash up. So as long as Fizz lines his ultimate on Talon, it should make it difficult for Talon to escape a gank from me. So I move mid lane, making sure to use my sweeping lens to check for any nearby wards, since I know Lee Sin is nearby, and if I'm spotted in a ward, he would definitely look to counter gank. There are no wards, Fizz lands his ult, and we move in getting a kill, and both of Talon's summoner spells. We then clear the remaining minions, and leave, since the wave is in a neutral position. I then kill my red, into taking the Blastcone plant to hop over the dragon pit. Some of you may be wondering, why exactly I'm doing this? Well, remember, we saw Lee Sin looking to gank bot. Then, when I ganked mid, I noticed that his blue buff would be spawning soon. A nice trick to remembering this is based on my own red respawning. Since I started at my red, and it's just respawning now, well then that means the first buff Lee Sin started at is also respawning now. And we already know from our early game scouting that he started at his blue. On top of all of this, I used another trick. When Lee Sin ganked bot, I hit tab and checked his items. He only had a hunter's machete, which told me he hadn't recalled yet and bought items. Compare this to myself, who had recalled and bought a skirmish saber and Caulfield's hammer. I've also got two kills this game, along with two early scuttles, not to mention the lane minions that I've soaked. Needless to say, I'm fairly certain I'm ahead of Lee Sin, and so I'm looking for two things when I jump the dragon pit. Either I find Lee Sin and look to kill him, or Lee Sin is nowhere to be found, in which case he either recalled or headed topside, and I'm safe to try and take the dragon. Sure enough, we spot Lee Sin and make quick work of him. Into then even taking the dragon after, at which point I recall. So at this point, you should all be aware that I'm quite ahead of Lee Sin, I'm 3 0, have 50 CS to 40, and I'm ahead around 1000 gold. So I start to push my lead, I take the scuttles that spawn, look to invade and steal his camps, along with securing the Rift Herald since the dragon hasn't respawned yet. So far so good, right? Well, not really. You see at this point, my Orn goes AFK. I'm sure he had a serious emergency. Maybe his toaster gains sentience, the singularity has occurred, and the human race is doomed. Or maybe his cat just caught on fire, regardless, he's not moving. As a response, I pick up two minion waves topside. But I don't stay any longer, since I won't get anything done here, I'll just have to sacrifice the tower. 
I then look mid. Remember, Talon used Flash earlier, and we already saw how Fizz's ultimate can guarantee us a kill. After the successful gank, I push the minions, planning on using the Rift Herald on the tower. Lee Zen shows up, but is two levels down and is easily tower dove. Keep in mind, I'm actually using a trick with the Rift Herald here. Typically, Rift Herald will do two and a half plates of damage to a turret. Now, every turret plate that you destroy will increase the tower's armor and magic resistance, making them tankier and harder to kill. So if you notice, I first focus auto attacks on the tower, taking the first plate into the second plate. At this point, the tower is much tankier, and it's now that I drop the Herald. This is because Rift Herald's headbutt does true damage and will ignore the buffed resistances of the tower. This is what allows me to destroy the tower despite it having over four turret plates at the start of it. And yes, in case you're wondering, our Orn top is still standing AFK in the exact same place. I then recall and look to group with my other teammates since the dragon is spawning soon. Now, I won't take a full-on teamfight as it would be a 4v5 without Orn, but I'm hoping we can make some picks. Fortunately, we are able to do just that, making a pick on the enemy Talon. I then keep chasing, with Talon dead, and with me being extremely fed, but unfortunately our AD carry misfortune didn't get the memo, or at least that farm in bot lane looks too good for her to pass up. I'm able to get the kill on Lee Sin, but my kindness gets the better of me, blocking Jin for Senna, getting myself killed. And yes, for those wondering, I did have flash up, no, I don't want to talk about it. This is a big mistake that I just made, as now I've given up a shutdown and the enemy team is free to take dragon since our jungler is dead. Don't worry though, Miss Fortune is back from farming and ready to, well, at least she tried. On the plus side, I think my death was a part of some sort of satanic ritual, as after I died, Orn immediately started moving again, teleporting into the fight. What a strange coincidence. From here on out, the game will follow a familiar pattern. I'll avoid teamfights due to my teammates being so weak, and instead focus on making picks on the enemies out of position. Also, this is probably a good time to talk about the build I'll be going. You see, I'm not going for the standard full lethality assassin Kha'Zix. Instead, I'm actually going Conqueror Bruiser Kha'Zix. This is due to two things. First, the enemy's team composition. Volley Bear is a tanky champion, so a lethality build would leave me weak to him. Talon would have burst of his own, and with his invisibility would make 1v1s against him extremely difficult. And I'm looking to carry this game, not just trade one for one when fights break out. Leeson also has his shield and his kick to help protect his backline. So my build will be the Red Smite Warrior's Enchantment, Black Cleaver, Ninja Tabby, Sterox Gage, Death Stance, and Guardian Angel. This will make me tanky enough so that there's no way for Talon or Lee Sin to 1v1 me. At the same time, my Black Cleaver, Conqueror, and Death Stance will help me shred armor and fight Volley Bear. At the same time, I'll still have enough damage to pretty much one-shot Jin and Zyra. So what's the downside to this build? Well, it's more expensive in comparison to Lethality. A standard Lethality build on Kha'Zix would cost around 15,000, 25 gold. In comparison, the Bruiser build costs 16,225 gold. That's 1,200 more expensive. At the same time, Lethality kicks in faster, giving you a bigger boost in the early to mid game. The Bruiser build takes longer to get online, with your big powers by hitting at Black Cleaver, Sterax, and Death Stance. So team composition is one reason I'm going for the Bruiser build, but as we mentioned earlier in this guide, scaling is also important. The Bruiser build scales much harder into late game compared to Lethality. And trust me, we need that 1v9 scaling. Shortly after making that pick on Talon, we take the Rift Herald that spawned. For whatever reason, my O2 Misfortune thinks the Rift Herald is better suited on her and then immediately heads top. There's a big problem here. First, the entire enemy team is missing. Second, our Senna is in bot lane and our Fizz is in mid lane. The only people going top are our Orn and Misfortune, the two weakest players on our team. Grouping with them as three to push this tower would be a terrible mistake, since the best case scenario we'd get is a 3v3, and I'm not entirely confident we'd even win that. Worst case scenario, the entire enemy team collapses. I can only assume that Misfortune and Orn are not yet familiar with basic arithmetic, and four of the enemy champions clear the Herald, make quick work of them, not even killing the top tower. This pattern of less than perfect decision making continues throughout the game. Head into a side lane is Misfortune against a Talon instead of holding pushes mid when we have a Fizz and Orn to cover the side lanes. Check. Random Orn pushing up mid lane against the entire enemy team with two of his teammates off the map. Check. In the meantime, I stall out the game the best way that I can, pressuring side lanes to pull the enemy to defend and away from grouping and forcing objectives, making picks, and using my champion's completely balanced kit and scaling build to outplay the enemy. Yes, sometimes I'm forced into hero plays, having to steal a dragon. But for the most part, I'm using basic fundamentals. Avoiding straight on 5v5 teamfights, and instead trying to look for small skirmishes or picks on the enemy by controlling vision and taking number advantages. And yes, if you're wondering, after this pick, Orn really did just walk through the enemy's mid tower and die. But here's a great example of what I mean by stalling the game. 
After this fight, I see Talon split pushing bot and move to defend. Remember, I know that with my bruiser build, I'll be able to survive against him. However, I am low on health, and so I play defensive, just looking to clear the minions and not trying to force an engagement. During this time, Ms. Fortune's keyboard unfortunately short circuits once again, and she dies for free. Talon then gets low on health, but I don't overchase as the enemy team is collapsing. Additionally, if I die in this position, the enemy will be able to force Baron. My priority is staying alive so that I can always threaten the Baron's steal and assist in defending the Baron. Orn is now respawned from his earlier death. And thinking that he's Goku, he looks to go Super Saiyan and 2v5, only to realize he's a bit more like Krillin. I don't follow him, as if I die in this position, I'll give up Baron and it's likely game over. After holding mid tower, I spot Talon splitting top, again, moving to defend. As you can see, I'm not forcing any plays, instead just playing defensive, waiting for the enemy to make mistakes. This buys enough time for me to hit level 16 and finish my core items. And the next time Talon split pushes, I show the power of the bruiser build, surviving his burst and making quick work of him. I then want to head straight mid and group with my team and look for a 5v4 teamfight while Talon is dead. Unfortunately, you guessed it, while I was killing Talon, Thing 1 and Thing 2 thought it was a good idea to take the 4v4, quickly dying for nothing. Once they respawn, we regroup and I again look to take vision control around Baron to help set up more picks. This leads to a kill on Volibear, and we immediately turn to threaten Baron since any teamfight would be a 5v4 in our favor, at which point Talon then assassinates our misfortune. And although Baron is low, we haven't spotted Lee Sin. Lee Sin is currently the same level as me, which means his smite will do the same damage as mine. And Lee Sin has a lot of ways to outsmite me and steal the Baron away. But this is the power of playing scaling carry champions. Instead of forcing the smite war on Baron, I call to back off and reset. I don't want to decide the game off a 50-50 smite when I know I can win through scaling and more calculated play. Compare this to if I was playing Rek'Sai, Lee Sin, or Lethality Kha'Zix, I would probably commit to Baron in this position since I'd be getting outscaled. Shortly after, our patience finally pays off, and the enemy team starts falling apart, looking to force Elder Dragon 5v5. We look to defend it, and in the enemy's retreat they split off, making some mechanical misplays, and we finally get that fight we're looking for. After acing them, we then immediately head to take the Elder Dragon. We've now successfully stalled the game out, we are level 18, full build, and have Elder Dragon. We immediately head to Baron to regain vision control, and the enemy now has to face check into Fog of War trying to scout if we're doing it. With Elder Dragon, our scaling kicking in, and vision advantage, I'm confident we can win 5v5 teamfights. At this point in the game, all that takes is that single winning teamfight, and then we can push down mid and end the game. Now, I know in this guide we poked fun at our teammates here and there. But if there's one thing I want you to take away from this guide is to understand that if I was playing a different champion that doesn't have late game carry potential like Rek'Sai, Elise, Trundle, Sejuani, Olaf, etc, how as soon as Orn AFK'd, the game likely would have been over. And that on these more hard carry champions, you need to have a really good mental. As soon as I started getting flamed, I muted my teammates, and despite my teammates AFKing and feeding, I did my best to stall the game, knowing that I could carry if the game went on long enough. Sure, having that late game carry potential is great, but if as soon as you start falling behind early or having issues with your teammates, if you just give up, well, then you may be better off just playing an early game jungler. Alright, that's going to do it for this one. What is your favorite style of jungling? Early game, farming, late game carry? Let us know in the comments section below. Remember to like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon. And if you want to rank up and take your game to the next level, make sure to check out our website, skillcap.com, link in the description below. My name's Hexadecimal, signing off, and as always, good luck and have fun on Summoner's Rift.